eight million stories in the naked city. This is one of them. Born in 1846, Johannes Kali came from a very old country family outside of Hanover, Germany. Growing up, John faced famine, political turmoil, civil riots, and combat, serving the German army during the Franco-Prussia War of 1870 as a young man. Even though previously in America at that time, New York gangs were attacking German and Irish migrants in places like Hoboken, his lifelong dream was to still come to the United States to raise kids to be successful. That dream finally came true. When he passed in 1933, he had grown to become a notable builder in Brooklyn. He designed and built the famous Tivoli Plaza and later Feltman's Tivoli, otherwise known as Deutscher Gardens at Coney Island. He specialized in the Brooklyn area, Flatbush, Bath Beach, Blythebourne, and Bay Ridge. In, in 1880, 1880 John, John left his wife and six children at home, boarding a merchant ship in Hamburg headed to New York. He settled in Brooklyn, where he specialized in the building trade. He secured building plans, permits, financing, and built nearly a thousand homes, churches, and commercial buildings, many of which survive today quickly became very wealthy as one of Brooklyn's largest developers. In 1882, he arranged first-class passage for his wife Bertha and their children. The family lived on one of two large adjacent commercial lots of what one day would become Prospect Hall. In 1892, the hall opened its doors. It had an exciting venue that often included a dozen public events nightly while on weekends, operas, vaudeville, plays, bowling, and masquerade balls were always booked. After nightly homework, we kids had the run of the place, including pit stops at one of the six unattended bars, sipping directly from beer spouts, leaving no messy evidence of spent beer steins. Business and the times were great. Suddenly, just before Christmas, on December 10th, 1900, there was a horrific fire. Originally entirely built as a wooden structure, over 200,000 square feet was destroyed. In 1911, son William began taking over management duties. During the Prohibition, private rooms were set up for trusted patrons. A young underworld upstart, Al Capone, frequented the opera and hidden bar there. It is rumored he received his facial scar in an upstairs restroom attack. They also had a summer retreat home in New Hampshire. John and Bertha retired to Daytona Beach. Both are buried at Cypress Hills, New York, interned within their mausoleum. Adoringly, her children called her Gross Mama. She had a keen sense of humor and sometimes wrote and recited poetry. Initially, 
Bertha did all the cooking for Prospect Hall, deep in the basement. As activity grew, several commercial kitchens were added, serving up to a thousand guests per ballroom on busy weekends. Since arriving in Brooklyn, she raised her six children speaking only German and later gave birth to two more, John L. and Emma. She was present when her oldest daughter, Meta, had me, born on her birthday, July 25, 1897. On September 29, 1929, John and Bertha celebrated their 50th golden wedding anniversary at Prospect Hall with hundreds of guests. I miss my grandparents dearly. The legacy started at Prospect Hall created a bright future for us all. My mother, Meta, was school age when the family joined their father in Brooklyn. Little is known of her youth except that she had only a grammar school education. At a young age, however, my mother was lent one summer to a wealthy family in Albany, New York, where she acquired a sense of decorum and social grace. She was ambitious and independently studied art with a reportedly famous art instructor at Cooper Union Institute in New York City. Meta became an accomplished artist. She once copied a full-length museum painting of Daphne and Chloe fleeing the storm, all six foot within a scarlet red velvet frame which hung in father's studio. She married Hubert F. France. He started France Manufacturing Company and became very successful. There had been a hiatus in their courtship, but Meta waited because Hubert was the intelligent man she wanted as father of her children. Meta was dainty in her ways, always well-dressed, and she saw to it that all her children received a stellar education. She was an excellent housekeeper and trained servants to serve well at the table. When she passed away, well after Hubert's death, she donated much of their art, furnishings, and collections to museums. Hubert was born in München Gladbach, Germany. Hubert had an excellent education, which included Latin, Greek, and English. He knew shorthand well, serving England as secretary for Prime Minister Gladstone. He enlisted in the German army but was stricken with scarlet and typhoid fevers simultaneously. Recovered, he did not rejoin but rather immigrated to the United States to earn his keep by selling Catholic icons of worship. A German book on electricity was the only formal training he had in what became his pioneering achievement in inventing and installing electrical switchboards, panels, and outlets. The newly created 1886 electrical subway of New York City had switches designed and built by Krantz Manufacturing Company. His business prospered in the early 1890s. Hundreds of inventions and patents were added. In 1896, George Westinghouse built, after beating out Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison, the Niagara Falls Hydroelectric Project. Westinghouse needed 110 volt patents to counter Edison's 12 volt system. Krantz owned most of these patents. Consequently, Westinghouse merged with Krantz, making him an instant millionaire. Their new home was built on Argyle Road around the corner from his best friend and brother-in-law, Dr. F. Strange Colley, making the move from Park Slope to the more prestigious neighborhood of Prospect Park South in Flatbush. Prospect Hall was soon wired by Krantz as the first commercial building in Brooklyn to do so. My parents also purchased a large parcel in rural Sugar Hill, New Hampshire, 
and built a fabulous summer retreat for our growing family. In 1912, the Krances traveled Europe via automobile with other pillars of U.S. industry. Thomas Flyer cars, huge open vehicles, were shipped to Naples whence via St. Gothard Pass. They traveled through Rhine territory. On one occasion, nine persons were piled into their car, begoggled with dust coats and veils. The trip to Mines was made. The big event was the Kaiser Parade, whereby thousands of cavalry companies marched ahead of and to the rear of Kaiser Wilhelm. With the pounding of soldiers' steps and their helmets most impressive. Later, recuperating from an operation, Hubert toured Florida and brought up a 170 plus acre parcel of land in West Palm Beach, naming the development Prospect Park South which he then sold into smaller lots with small down payments to save on taxes. The streets were named after Prospect Park South, Argyle, Buckingham Road, Olive Street, and a half dozen others. The property is an eye shot of Marjorie Merriweather Post Mar-a-Lago, just down the beach. On another lavish tour in Europe, buying antique furnishings and fine paintings, the couple became aware that Florida land was now a bust. Properties thought sold had to be taken back, resulting in heavier taxes. To soften the blow, Meta and Hubert decided to build a fabulous beach mansion on the entire land. They were equally vigilant about plans for Villa Marivo, where they would spend winters. The interior of the Florida home was outstandingly beautiful with tiled floors, antique furniture, Persian rugs, and fine paintings. One life-size portrait of Hubert by Meta, seated and contemplating, greeted incoming guests at the end of a vista through the living room. To obscure the gaping entrance to the dining room from the pantry, Meta painted a three-section screen in the fashion of an ancient tapestry. At the death of Hubert of a very painful intestinal cancer, Meta kept the home, alone and without household help. Hubert and Meta left three children, Marguerite, Herman, and Hubert. On Grossmama Colley's birthday, July 25th, 1897, her first grandchild was born in Brooklyn. I was christened Marguerite Bertha Elsie Krantz. In 1907, on Argyle Road, Brooklyn, I attended nearby public school number 139. Having graduated in 1910, I was enrolled at Packer Collegiate Institute on Jerolamon Street, Brooklyn. I soon qualified for freshman class at Bryn Mawr College. I graduated in June 1919. Because I spoke German so well, I did four years and three. Then came two years of teaching English and putting on plays at Scarsdale High School. In the summer of 1924, I became engaged to Emilio Iwerson who I'd met at the Brooklyn Social Club after an evening of a staged play. Emilio came from German stock, whose father, also Emilio, was a highly respected businessman in the German colony of Mexico City. Our wedding took place at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Brooklyn. But because of a rate conflict with my uncle William, then manager at Prospect Hall, we elected to have our reception at my parents' Argyle home and honeymoon in Mexico City, Havana, and finally at my parents' Florida home. In 1926, our new Scarsdale, New York home was ready to move into. We loaded the home with antique European furniture and Emilio purchased a brand new presidential Studebaker sedan. Life was good. In 1937, with family connections, Emilio was commissioned as president, 
to run the 200-year-old cutlery firm J.A. Henkel's factory in Solingen, Germany. The move with our three container loads of furniture was made in October to a lovely park-like villa in a suburb near the plant. I drove the imported Studebaker, always getting the boss to his office by 7.30 a.m. each morning. In 1939, World War II was declared. Poland, September 1939. The German foe begins its ruthless march of conquest and sets the stage for World War II. Soon thereafter, we were ordered to put up severely wounded soldiers and refugees in our home. A newly installed SS general took an intense liking to our beloved Studebaker and commandeered it for his private use. Trolley rides to market in the office became more difficult. War rations became smaller and smaller. Thus, it was decided to move within a few blocks of the factory in one of several employee housing units with only enough space for two. We survived on cereal. In November 1944, that building suffered ruthlessness and windowlessness because of a direct bomb upon the factory across the street most likely because the Waffen SS had ordered the company earlier to produce strictly military knives and bayonets. Water had to be brought in by the barrel. Electricity was highly intermittent and the coal soon gave out. Tenants once on the second and third floors had to seek other quarters. When the war ended, Emilio had lost 70 pounds and I 40. As soon as mail service returned after the war, I sought permission to return to the US. Visas took almost two years to come through. Meanwhile, Emilio had been banished under suspicion of colluding with the Nazis. In 1947, I was allowed to leave after six weeks in deserted former Nazi barracks, followed by an ocean crossing on the Ernie Pyle, which was scrapped as unseaworthy the following trip. Only after two more years was Emilio allowed to come home again. The factory had been so badly damaged after 40 direct hit bombs that business could not go on. Upon my return, I kept house for Mother Meta at Sugar Hill. In 1949, upon Emilio's return from Europe, then entirely exonerated, marital troubles developed. We lived apart until mother's estate had been settled. In 1954, I moved to Reno for divorce. I subsequently founded a metaphysical church in New York City with Raymond Charles Barker, minister and instructor. After two years of intense instruction and giving lectures in Greenwich, Connecticut, I was invited to join a group of Unity students in Plainfield, New Jersey. This engagement resulted in me funding the Church of Religious Science in Plainfield, 1960. From this, I wrote a book in 1981 on my arduous spiritual path entitled Mind Matters, still in print this very day. With our father's assistance, Brother Hubert attended MIT. And while in Boston, driving father's open Packard, he met Janet Matthews, a Texan who was attending Wellesley. They soon married. After college, he was employed by Bell Labs in Berkeley Heights, New Jersey, in the patent department. His work on the telephone jack netted him notable success. Again at MIT, my other brother Herman had an apartment of his own. He played polo and zizzed about his whippet. Sometimes his girlfriend, Viola, zizzed with him. Scholastically, he was tops, always on the dean's list. At graduation in 1928, he and Viola married and started a two-year introduction course at Otis Elevator Company. Herman rose to president at both the Buenos Aires Argentina and Milan, Italy factories. From 1962 to 1970, he served as president 
of the American Chamber of Commerce in Italy, receiving high honors from the U.S. State Department. Alas, we've all since passed away. Frederick attended grade school in Germany. After the move to Brooklyn, he graduated with a medical degree from Long Island College Hospital in 1893. He soon married Loretta Duffy from Brooklyn. In 1897, he received the first medical degree from the National College of Electrotherapeutics, interrupted by a one-year stint as a U.S. Army surgeon during the Spanish-American War. Serving facially wounded soldiers from the battlefield initiated his lifelong passion for what would be later termed plastic surgery. Dr. Cauley invented the Cauley X-ray focus tube, the X-ray printing process, the direct reading X-ray meter, and over a hundred patented medical instruments used in plastic surgery. In 1924, Dr. Cauley was described in the Los Angeles Times as the most famous pioneer plastic surgeon who could replace features disfigured by accidents or war or missing since birth. Frederick owned the famed Japanese house on Buckingham Road in Prospect Park South, around the corner from his sister Meta and Hubert Krantz. Hubert and Fred were lifelong friends, meeting in their youth when Cauley was editor of the Electric Age magazine both competitors in who could acquire the most patents. Frederick introduced Hubert to his sister, Meta. Each was the other's best man at their weddings. Frederick was the first to x-ray a live, full human body. He used his youngest brother, John L., depicted in his textbook, The X-Rays, the first complete book on the subject. This was followed by a lecture in New York City, whereupon Edison, Tesla, France, and Westinghouse all attended. Afterwards, Thomas Edison grandstanded in the lobby that he was merely weeks away from documenting a full adult x-ray, which he never did. Frederick was constantly zapping himself, patients, his siblings, children, and grandchildren with unprotected radiation. Many died years later of internal carcinoma cancers including himself in 1929 at age 58, and later his only granddaughter, Consuelo Palmetto Smith. Frederick wrote numerous books, including the recent Rungen Discovery, Medico Surgical Radiology, Subcutaneous Hydrocarbon Prosthesis, The X rays, Their Production and Applications, Plastic and Cosmetic Surgery, Pen Lyrics, The Grown Baby Book. Fifty and One Tales of Modern Fairyland, Axel and Volberg and Olaf, a scientific novel predicting futuristic electronic appliances like electric toasters, shavers, sewing machines, refrigerators, washing machines, dryers, copy machines, and even electric automobiles. His 1911 textbook, Plastic and Cosmetic Surgery, written in the Japanese house, became his most lucrative endeavor. Hollywood soon came calling. The movie industry was growing and he had insider connections via his brothers and Fred Balchofer, then at Universal Pictures. Starlets and studios alike needed plastic surgery to enhance and correct what nature had failed to provide. Dr. Cauley's first West Coast client was famed opera diva, Marguerite Namara. She was scheduled to star in her first silent film, Stolen Moments, with Rudolph Valentino. 
The operation was such a success, it immediately elevated Coley's Hollywood career. For many years, Fred Loretto and son Friedel lived in Hollywood. It was there at the port of Long Beach, California, in a bar, Friedel came upon a story from two sea merchants describing a jungle god, the Devil Devil, living on an uncharted island in the South Pacific. Dr. Colley agreed to fund the exhibition to the island. However, he was suddenly taken east for an operation on his cancer and subsequently died at Brooklyn's St. Luke's Hospital in 1929. His wife, who had always instinctively avoided his X-ray contraptions, survived him by nearly 30 years. Frederick immersed himself in theater at Prospect Hall, directing and writing plays. A popular young talent there who called himself Professor Duffy starred in many of these plays. It was presumably here that Duffy's sister, Loretto, caught the eye of Fred at rehearsals and performances. Frederick had quickly found a wife. Loretto was born to James T. Duffy and Ellen Jenkins, who were from important political families in Melbourne, Australia. Loretto fancied herself a writer, creating dozens of books and screenplays. Her most famous novel, The Blue Lawn, sold briskly. She quickly bore her medical profession, Wunderkind, three beautiful children, Friedel, Elaine, a.k.a. Kitty, and Iris. Life was idyllic residing in the Japanese house. Loretto died in Daytona Beach, Florida, 1958. Nicknamed Frito, he and his sisters were raised privileged under their famous father's watchful eye and in their tourist attraction abode, the Japanese house. It is believed that no nails were used in its construction held together by breathable interlocking joints. Neighborhood pals were sons of business pillars. Prospect Park South was Millionaire's Row, where the Gillette family lived behind them and one of the founders of Fruit of the Loom brand lived around the corner as did the founder of Exlax. With both sisters married young, Friedel joined his parents on their move to Hollywood. His then girlfriend and soon to be wife, Dorothy Lurch followed. He was in his mid twenties and wanted to enter the movie business just like his uncles had. Because of his uncle's access to studios, he had free range to visit sets and industry hangouts, including Marion Davis and William Randolph Hearst Santa Monica Beach House, where his mother, Loretto, was Marion's executive assistant. Friedel soon introduced his father to the two sea merchants he met in a Long Beach bar. They told how each year, to ensure tranquility upon the island, an islander was sacrificed by the tribe to the devil devil who lived deep in the jungle. Father Cawley soon got the filmmaking bug too, and they set out to make the first talky documentary film Death Drums of New Guinea. Father Colley agreed to finance and command the expedition. Later, the sailors delivered a Russian captain, Harry Corpelin, owner of the merchant ship SS Sterling, and together secured a crew strolling the docks. Friedel put the filmmaker crew together. However, because of his father's untimely death, Friedel took helm as Commander F. Strange Colley and with crew, they set sail to the mysterious island in 1929. Upon returning, Friedel needed completion funds. First, he generated notable press on both coasts. With developing reels in hand in search of investors in New York City, he pitched the story. A 
much more is there? Another five reels? Lights up. <laughs> this is it? This is what we get for our 40 grand? Yes, I understand that, but fellas, we're not making that film anymore. And I'll tell you why. The story has changed. The script has been rewritten. Life intervened. I've come into possession of a map. The sole surviving record of an uncharted island. A place that was thought to exist only in myth. Until now. Whoa, Carl. Slow down. Is he asking for more money? He's asking us to fund a wild goose chase. I'm talking about a primitive world. Never before seen by man. The ruins of an entire civilization. The most spectacular thing you've ever seen. That's where I'll shoot my picture. Will there be boobies? Boobies? Jigglies. Jablongas, bazoons. In my experience, people only go to these films to observe the undraped form of the native girls. What are you, an idiot? The Wall Street crash was in full bloom. So he created Capital Attractions Film Company, housed at Prospect Hall. The film came out in 1932 and played successfully across the country and later in cult theaters well into the 1950s. jungle, mountain, and swamp, where many tribes of savages are ruled by mystery and superstition, where the devil devil reigns supreme, a land where the white man's civilization has made but little progress. Gliding forward on the Pacific rollers in the Gulf of Papua, with sandbars, coral reefs, and treacherous currents, we hold to Wondering what this strange land held in store for us. In 1933, quite suspiciously, Marion C. Cooper came out with his film King Kong. Suspiciously, the very same story, only dramatized. For his remaining life, Friedel was into the promotion and newsprint business. He and Dorothy had no children. He died in the Bronx, 1978. Even in her teens, Elaine, affectionately dubbed Kitty, stunningly stood out. She garnered the attention of famed Saturday Evening Post illustrator Arthur William Brown. Appearing in many of her assignments, her classic looks could help sell disillusioned high society indifference. Seeing her in print, famed writer Bill Coram, first syndicated sports columnist, asked for her hand in marriage. She accepted. Ladies and gentlemen, the famous syndicated sports columnist and president of Churchill Downs, Mr. Bill Corum. If there's one thing I've learned in my 35 years of covering sports, it is that a favorite sport is a personal thing. And the same goes for cigarettes. I smoke Luckies because they give me the enjoyment I like and they taste better than any other cigarette to me. Sports columnist Bill Corum's got the right idea. It's all a matter of taste, and the fact is, Lucky's taste better for two good reasons. They had a son, Robbie, who suffered dearly for not excelling as a beloved super sports hero. Uncle Friedel grew to become more of a father figure 
for the disillusioned youngster. When friends and associates traveled south for the races in Kentucky, the Corms were on everyone's list to dine with. Later, Kitty and Bill fully retired to Florida to be nearer her mother Loretto and nearby her aunt and Villa Marivo. Elaine died in Daytona Beach, Florida. Not to be outdone by her notable sister, Iris was befriended by famed Glamour magazine cover artist Edna Crompton, first female magazine cover illustrator. Iris graced the front covers of nearly 20 popular magazines of the Roaring Twenties, becoming the It Girl and Queen of the Flappers for that generation. She married Bernard Palmetto, the great-grandson of Count Adolphus Palmetto, and Baroness Charlotte Grote, heir to 12th century Henry the Lion and Matilda of England. The young couple became gads about town with F. Scott Fitzgerald, wife Zelda and pal's cousin, Roland Palmetto, underwriter of Lehman Brothers and owner of Stowe Mountain and Mad River Glen Ski Resorts. He also established the first men's and women's Olympic ski teams. Divorced early, the couple had only one child, Consuelo Palmetto Smith, who was sadly sent off in youth to be raised at boarding schools and by grandmother Palmetto and aunt in the summers. During World War II, Iris dedicated her life to the Red Cross, retiring near her mother and sister at Daytona Beach, Florida, passing away in 1960. William D. Cauley was an interesting fellow. John and Bertha Cauley's next oldest son appeared in many plays produced at Prospect Hall. While most children play pretend dress up in their backyards, these Cauley children had their very own 600 seat theater in their backyard, performing for mostly paying audience members on warm summer nights. Every play would feature one or two notable Broadway headliners on hiatus to attract an otherwise finicky Brooklyn crowd. The Collie kids often played supporting roles in these performances. Ruggedly handsome William grew to become one of the headliners. Later, in 1908, William starred in several of his brother Herman's silent films produced at Prospect Hall. They called their outfit Crescent Films. Sherlock Holmes was William's most popular role. In Sherlock Holmes and the Great Murder Mystery, authors Robert Pohl and Douglas Hart of Sherlock Holmes on the Screen wrote that this film was the fourth Sherlock Holmes film in the world and the first to introduce Watson's relationship to the detective. Nickelodeon theaters featured these films across the country. Later, he and Sister Clara performed important acting roles in The Wild Goose Chase, produced by Lyceum Stock Company and directed by Cecil B. DeMille in 1915. Earlier, he attracted the attention of and married Emma Munch in 1900, daughter of a prominent brewer in Brooklyn. William inherited management duties of Prospect Hall in 1911, obviously demanding his full-time attention. Also coming from Nouveau Riche wealth, Emma was accustomed to an elaborate lifestyle. 
as William now considered himself a privileged elitist. With both parents, John and Bertha, passing in the 1930s, the grown Collie children were to eventually divide proceeds from the sale of Prospect Hall after probate. However, the sale was postponed because of the economy, the Great Depression, and eminent World War II. Consequently, with William as manager, he encumbered the property via very large liens, supporting his and Emma's many trips to Europe, their lavish lifestyle, and expensive painting and antique purchasing sprees. This resulted in late and missing payments. Around the end of World War II, the property was foreclosed upon, as debts with interests surpassed the property's value. The remaining Collie family members thus lost out of any inheritance. William hid at friends' homes and flop houses as unobtrusively as possible and in real neediness. His eyesight and hearing were failing. His sole family contact was with sister Elsie in Long Beach, New York, as the other siblings disowned him. Elsie, who adored him growing up, took him in. She decorated her basement as a small apartment with a secret entrance. She was the jolly redhead who many called lovely. Years earlier, after a headcount on the freezing sidewalk in front of the Prospect Hall fire, she was discovered missing. Without hesitation, the next door neighbor, Pastor Barsh, a Lutheran minister, dove into the fiery entrance, exiting with the passing out Elsie after an excruciating five minutes. Later, on September 30th, 1903, Elsie married John Faber. Flash forward to World War II, whereupon Elsie introduced William to her dear friend and nurse, Augusta Langenberg. A romance soon grew. Being from old Connecticut money, she footed the bill for William's many expensive operations. Hiding out in her family's bucolic Westport, Connecticut village manor, William concluded he had escaped his demons. William died in 1959 at age 84. Clara Coley was always the socializer and often performed in plays at Prospect Hall. Later, she performed as supporting character roles for films with grander budgets. When she married Herman Intiman, they moved to Oceanside, Long Island, where later, well into the 1940s, all related family members, including those traveling through New York, joined them for Sunday good times and eats, grandly fulfilling in for her dear old parents' role after they retired to Florida. There were always winter stays in Daytona Beach. Clara was very much an active member in community work, the Girl Scouts, and member in the Eastern Star, while Herman was a lifetime member of Minerva Lodge, 792 Brooklyn. These connections continued even after the complete move to Daytona Beach. After Herman's death, Clara suffered a broken hip and was forced into a wheelchair. She was a great family person and harbored Sister Meta for some time after the Crans West Palm Beach home was sold. Clara was always busy and socially active until her death in 1960. Herman was the third oldest son. He filled in for the youngest roles at the Venetian Garden Summer Theater at Prospect Hall. Being one of the nation's first pilots, following the Wright brothers, Herman built his own plane from a kit, compliments of his father, John A. 
He later became a flight instructor at Pensacola Army Base during World War I. In 1908, at Crescent Films, he and brother William produced moving pictures upon the outdoor theater stage between Prospect Hall and their home quarters. Years later, in 1967, there was a textbook written on the beginning of modern American film history. It prominently featured the Cully brothers, specifically Prospect Hall, and because of this, Brooklyn itself as the birthplace of the studio lot. The book was entitled One Reel a Week by Fred Balsoffer and Arthur C. Miller. Miller was a 13-year-old neighbor of Prospect Hall and got his start in his lustrous Hollywood cinematic career at Crescent. The following is an opening chapter. In the spring of 1908, I was looking for a partner to form a company to make moving pictures. I soon found Hermann Kali whose father owned Prospect Hall in South Brooklyn, New York. The hall had an open-air summer beer garden. On warm summer evenings, neighborhood families would sit around at separate tables, drink nickel schooners of beer, and watch vaudeville on a stage. On Saturday and Sunday evenings, a screen rolled down from the arch over the stage that was used to show silent films, accompanied by a piano. If it rained, people would move inside to the opera stage. Idle during weekday afternoons, we used the stage for our open-air film studio, mostly for staging interiors, as daylight was our only source of illumination. We purchased a huge Pathé model camera and arranged the laboratory under the stage for developing and editing. This was one of the first modern production studios, with two large stages, a vast wardrobe department from the many plays and masquerade events, security, catering, lab facilities, and numerous offices, all complements of Prospect Hall. Later, when not on location, the term, we'll be shooting on the lot, was initiated. We named our outfit the Crescent Film Company. Herman Obrock Jr., the stage electrician at Prospect Hall's Opera Room Theater, spent a lot of time with us. He wanted to learn the business. He accompanied us to Coney Island to make a movie called Shoot the Shoots at Luna Park, where a flat-bottom boat came down an incline to make a huge splash in a large pool. We photographed more scenes on the crowded Coney Island boardwalk. After shooting for two days, we ran out of film, so back we went to the Summer Garden Lab to develop what we had shot. This was our first film we produced, when all the scenes were spliced together, there were two full reels of a thousand feet each. Film Exchange Row was on 14th Street in New York City, so with reels in hand, that's where we headed. First, we called upon Empire Film Exchange. The exchange was owned by Charles Bauman and Adam Kessel, two well-seasoned business operators. Nickelodeon's a novelty at the time, were returning reels they had just shown, exchanging for next week. By the end of that same year, theaters grew to 8,000 in the U.S. By the following year, 26 million Americans would see a film weekly. We hit the market perfectly and at a nickel apiece. Charles Bauman looked at me and said, If we buy five prints of each, will you give us an exclusive? Cawley was elated and immediately began talking about our next subject. For these two pictures, we used Herman's older brother, William Cawley, as our star. An accomplished actor in the Hall's weekly plays, William seemed to enjoy making pictures. Sherlock Holmes was our biggest picture, the first to depict the character of Dr. Watson. In fine slapstick fashion, the culprit of the murder turns out to be an escaped gorilla. William Cawley began getting noticed by others, D.W. Griffith and Cecil B. DeMille, who later starred him in longer films. Our little business was going along just fine until a fellow entered the summer garden looking for us. He introduced himself as Al McCoy and said he represented the Edison Manufacturing Company. He wanted to see the camera we were using. At that time, Edison was trying to form a cartel, the Motion Picture Patents Company, to force all filmmakers to forfeit much of the profits as royalty for use of his patent. I noticed Cawley was concerned. 
McCoy evidently never forgot our little encounter, for it was his persistent spying and harassment that caused the Crescent Film Company to later dissolve. The McCoy situation reached the old man with a cease and desist order. To avoid litigation, Herman talked to me and said he would like to sell his shares. I said I would find someone to buy him out. News soon got around that Crescent was on the block. Distributors Bauman and Kessel always treated us fairly. I suggested the two of them could be half partner while I would be the other half. They would pay Collie his due and put up production funds against my experience. The new company would be known as the New York Motion Picture Company. Overtly battling Edison's control of motion pictures, the company within a year moved to Hollywood, owning and morphing into Bison Films for Westerns, Keystone Studios for Comedies, and in 1912, Universal Pictures for Dramas. Profits grew impressively from 1909 until 1912, but I missed Prospect Hall, the Collies, the convenience and low cost of our little studio we created. Arthur C. Miller went on to earn three Academy Awards for Best Cinematography, John Cromwell's Anna and the King of Siam, John Ford's How Green Was My Valley, and Henry King's The Song of Bernadette. Didn't you hear me? He was director of cinematography of over 150 films, including the Oxbow Incident. Shirley Temple Run. This is the child. Ah, nice little girl. Let me go! I want my grandfather. You'll never see your grandfather again. Come on. Heidi! Heidi! And yes, he received his start as a 13-year-old with Brooklyn's very own Crescent Film Company at Prospect Hall. Herman O'Brock Jr., Prospect Hall's electrician, went on as a notable cameraman with 17 credits working with Laurel and Hardy and others. and I went on to direct 162 film classics, 133 credits as cinematographer, as producer 96 credits, and 30 as screenwriter, and a legendary American pioneer of silent films. Years later, he had an amusement arcade business in Coney Island. Herman married Anna Witt. They had a son who died, witnessed by his father, while shoveling snow. When Herman became very ill, his brother William moved in with him, cared for him until he died. John L. and Emma Colley were the youngest of the Colley children and were both born in America, much younger than their German-born siblings. For the most part, they were reared by hired nannies in separate quarters. Not much is known about Emma, whereupon, conversely, much is known about her brother. John L. was very close to the Krantz family. He visited often and played theater with us, reminiscing about the Venetian Garden theatrical days. He made and dressed puppets to cavort upon a small stage he had built. Later, he worked for Father Hubert in his Brooklyn factory, Krantz Manufacturing Company, in the office section. In 1912, he joined us in Switzerland, and with ladies he met at the inn, climbed Young Brow Mountain. One year, when I was close to graduation from Packard College, he served as my escort to the prom. That contact with my gorgeous girlfriends almost led to the end of his marriage with Carlene Hewitt. While living in Flatbush, their daughter Jacqueline was born. About this time, John secured a position of requiring artistic skills at a large Detroit department store. There, he became head of interior decorating for Hudson's and did all the buying, both domestically and abroad. 
grew out the 20s, 30s, and 40s. John, then considered an expert in the field, authorizing several columns in home decorating magazines, gave a series of interior decorating lectures across the nation, offering general tips in home decor like floors should be darker than walls and walls darker than ceilings. John and Carlene worked together wonderfully. After retirement, they moved to Nantucket for summers and had a thriving antique and gift shop business in their home. They had a circle of wealthy and influential friends. John outlived Carlene by many years and in a home near his daughter Jacqueline, gently passing away at his breakfast table. Jacqueline was born on July 29, 1915. She attended Liggett School, graduating in 1933 and began college at Vassar. During the Second World War, she joined the Red Cross, initially posted to New Guinea and the Philippines, where she helped support our fighting troops. After the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, she was immediately ordered to Japan and was posted at Kyoto. She was one of the first American women to enter Japan after the horrific bombings. Some of her memories from her service there are recorded in the book, We're in this war too. In 1952, she married Philip Herring and had one child, Victoria. Victoria grew to become the first female president of one of the nation's oldest and prestigious universities, Washington and Jefferson College. Jacqueline became a noteworthy archivist for the Nantucket Island community, whereupon she also kept a massive indexed archival library on the Cauley family in her home's basement. This, along with the extensive Valerie Krantz and Barbara Smith Benke collections, are the source of most of the Cauley family images depicted in this presentation. Jacqueline passed away peacefully at Nantucket Hospital, August 10, 2011. Thank mm -hmm. you.